Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mayank Prasad. I am working as a developer in InnoDB uh, development team in MySQL. And today I'll be talking about uh, what new we have introduced in InnoDB uh, in MySQL 8.0. Okay, so this is the safe harbor statement. It says uh, whatever I'm presenting over here is for informational purpose. Right. So this is the agenda of today's talk. Um, brief about you know so its engine and how it fits into my SQL architecture, and then we'll jump to the latest features we have delivered in 8.0, MySQL 8.0, and how these features have helped us to improve the performance and scalability. And then uh, question, if you guys have any? Right. So uh, let's go. So this is the. Uh, MySQL server architectures. The orange box you see in the center is the MySQL server, which have uh, multiple components, and uh, there are multiple uh, clients or or the connectors uh, using which the applications are connected to MySQL server. And inside this MySQL server, we have this uh, pluggable storage engine API interface. So uh, basically, anybody can uh, implement this storage engine API interface and plug its own storage engine to MySQL. Uh, we have multiple implementation of these APIs, like we have archive storage engine, we have memory storage engine, performance schema, etc. And one of them is InnoDB, uh, which is the default storage engine for MySQL. And this uh, InnoDB is the guy which is responsible to take the uh, application data and store them on the disk and take the data from disk and present it to the user or application whenever it is asked for. Right, so. Let's go to the new features in MySQL 8.0. Uh, oh, okay, this is okay. So this InnoDB storage engine is a transitional storage engine. As I said, this is a default storage engine for MySQL 5.5, and it is asset compliant. Uh, this InnoDB storage engine provides row-level locking. It provides crash recovery. It provides MVCC, multi-view concurrency control, and then it has foreign key referential integrity constraint also. And as I said, different storage engine are used for different purpose. And MinoDB is the default guy in MySQL. So let's go to the new features. In MySQL 8.0, we have been working for quite some time. And uh, we take feedback from the community, and we take feedback from the customers and understand their pain points, and then decide upon the features which are supposed to put in InnoDB. Uh, so in 8.0, we have worked on more than 67 uh, work log of features, and everybody has their, or each of the feature has its own importance and complexity. And but because of the constraint of 25 minutes, I have tried to uh, pull the, mo the most important one and which are more uh, significant to the customer. Let's see. So the uh, first thing which we have uh, important one in, in ODB in MySQL is the data dictionary. So data dictionary has the metadata of the tables stored inside it. So before this feature, the data dictionary was spread across at multiple places. So every table which is there in MySQL has its uh, FRM files on disk. So these FRM files keep the metadata of the tables, like the column names and the column type, et cetera. And then the InnoDB or the storage engine have their own copy of data dictionary. So uh, if at all any DDL is happening, which is causing the change in the data dictionary, so that both of the places have to be updated and should be kept in sync, and which was a very difficult and tedious task. And it was not crash safe also. So I have put down a uh, link here for the listed issue, which we have listed uh, what issue a customer can be thinking about. What we did in 8.0 is we came up with a uh, single source of truth, a single place where the dictionary information is stored, which is uh, DD tables. And these DD tables are part of DD table space, which is stored in MySQL. So now, because we have single source of truth, there is no need of uh, uh, making it's making multiple places to be in sync, and no more FRM files on the disk. And because we have a single place, we have introduced a new locking mechanism, which is meta lock, using which we can update this dictionary uh, information. And then we have, uh, uh, so somebody might have a question, right? I have a table in 5.7 or I have database in 5.7 and you say you have a new dictionary uh, in 8.0. So how is the uh, upgrade? So we have made sure that upgrade is smooth when the user is upgrading from 5.7 to 8.0. Uh, 
the information is ported into this DD tables, and at the end of the upgrade, the legacy you know DD tables are dropped. So at the upgrade, we have a single data dictionary and MySQL server running with that. Then apart from that, we have introduced uh, something called serialized dictionary information. Uh, this is basically the redundant copy of the data dictionary, uh, which we embed inside the IBD file itself. Uh, the main purpose is to make the IBD file uh, self-descriptive. And whenever we do any DDL, which causes the dictionary data to be updated, this information is also updated. In the table space file, we have a specific page where we store this information. And uh, how it could be used, I will explain in a couple of slides. Okay, and then we have introduced an IBD to SDI tool. Using this tool, a user can see what is the data dictionary information stored inside an IBD file. Let's see uh, how we can use this IBD to SDI tool in practice. So let's say uh, I have a table created uh, test.t1. It has two columns, ID and name, and ID is a primary key. And I run this IBD to SDI tool on this table, uh, table table space file, which is t1.ibd. And this is what I get. I get, okay, this is uh, uh, this is a table, which the name is t1. It is created in MySQL 8.0.19 version. The time when it was created, the last time it was altered, it belongs to schema uh, test. It has the column name ID, etc. Right, so where we can use this SDI uh, information. So let's say we, uh, we, we, we have a, a MySQL server, but somehow or some unfortunate incidents caused us to lose the DD table space, which has the data dictionary information. So now we are left with an IBD file, but we don't know the metadata of this file. But because we have this SDI information embedded in the IBD file itself, so we can use this uh, SDI tool to get this metadata information or the SDI information out of IBD file. And then using this uh, SDI information, we can import this uh, table space file into another MySQL running MySQL server, and use the and use the table uh, metadata, oh, sorry table data. And the import using this SDI is still in work in progress, so we are working on that. The next thing which we introduce in MySQL is DDL log table. So this table is an internal table in MySQL. It resides in DD table space and uh, the, the user dml and ddls are not allowed on this table so the main purpose of this table is to uh, basically store or uh, keep a record keep a track of physical operations which are happening on the disk when a ddl is running so let's say when you are uh, uh, running a create table so a new table space file is being created on that disk so this ddl uh, log table will record this information that, that the file has been created on the disk uh, the main purpose of this DDL log table is uh, all these physical operations which are happening on the disk when the DDL is running. And if at all there's a crash on MySQL server during the DDL, these physical operations are not, we are not able to roll them back just because, because we don't have any information about those. But with the help of this DDL log table, this information is persisted on the disk. And when we restart the server, we consult this DDL log table and we see, oh, there is an orphan entry left or an orphan physical file left on the disk. So we are supposed to get rid of that. And when the server is restarted, uh, we have MySQL server without any orphan file left or any file left behind. And the next thing which we have uh, is the instant DDL, uh, the add column was. So this was a very big pain point from the customer point of view. So if customer has a very big table and it wants to add a column in that table. So because of the row format dependency in my in, in ODB, uh, each and every row has a number of column information embedded in it. So the number of columns are changing. Each and every row is supposed to be modified. So when we do add table, uh, we basically rebuild the table completely. And if a table is big, it takes a lot of time. The more the table size is, the more time it takes. And uh, as I say, as, as I said, we are doing full table rebuilds. We pay the table and have brought off of the pool. So a lot of I happening. So this was very tedious for the customer. So what we did in 8.0 is we came up with this algorithm is equal to instant. So now what we do here is instead of going to each and every row and modifying the metadata or the header of the row, we keep some information into the data dictionary. And using this information, we present the user uh, row data in the format which should be after the add column has been done. So it, it saves time because no row is being touched. It saves spaces because no copy of the table is being made. 
and the space resources also because there is no not much io is happening so let me give you a pictorial view how this thing works so let's say we have a table in which there are multiple uh, rows and now on this table we are doing alter table add column with algorithm is equal to instant when this thing is happening what we are doing we are just storing some metadata information into data dictionaries and we are not going to touch any row on the table so that's how it is instant so irrespective of the size of the table if the table is uh, too big then also it takes the same amount of time if the table is very small it takes the same amount of time it's an instant column okay so we have a few limitation in this instant ddl or add add column implementation so as of now the column can be added only at the last so only the last column can be added instantly and only the dynamic uh, compact and redundant row format are supports are, are supported and if the table has a full text index uh, the add column is not supported there and the, the table the dd table spaces tables are, are not supported which is obvious because they are not the user tables and we are working to improve uh, it and we, uh, to get rid of the limitations. So stay tuned. We might have something coming up in future very soon. And then we have, oh, it's going ahead. One second. One second. I don't know why this presentation went back. Give me a second. Okay, so similarly to add column, we have rename column, which also has dependency that when the rename column is done, it was causing the table to be rebuilt which doesn't make any sense because rename talk column is just changing the name of the column, which is a data dictionary information. So we implemented that also in 8.0. So now the rename column is done with algorithm is equal to instant. And our aim is to make a more and more DDL to be instant. So stay tuned, okay. something new might be coming in the near future. And on the security front, we have uh, uh, encryption implemented in 8.0. So now the redo and undo logs, uh, which are basically the user data, they are encrypted now. We have introduced two global variables, uh, inodb redo log encrypt and inodb undo log encrypt. Using them, we can encrypt these logs. And then we have a port. Uh, I think it's wrong. Okay. We have, are you guys able to see the, screen, the presentation? Anybody can say yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, okay. So uh, we have uh, implemented and for shared tables is also now the table spaces can be created uh, an encrypted table space or at later point of time they be made encrypted with this single SQL command. And then the double add buffer, which is uh, nothing but a uh, Mm -hmm. uh, mechanism to make sure there are no torn writes on the disk that is also uh, encrypted now so if we have a table uh, which uh, is encrypted and when we are uh, flushing a page of the table on the disk the double add buffer which is getting the page of that table is also encrypted now uh, the undo log okay so the undo log also we have made improvement here so, uh, clear Seven undo log was part of system table space. So when the undo log increases, it takes more and more space on the system table space. And it was not possible to shrink the system table space when it goes very huge. So what we did in 8.0 is uh, we moved undo log out of system table space now. So now they have their own entity on the disk. So, and we provided uh, SQL interface also to manage these undo logs. So if user wants to have more and more undo log, it can create them using create undo logs. And if you want to see want to drop the existing undo logs they're not more used you can drop them and the truncation of undo logs is also happening uh, automatically behind the scene so uh, and, and by default the two undo logs table spaces are there and when the server is running at least two undo table spaces should be there 
The next thing which we introduce in 8.0 is the dedicated server mode. So this is for those customers who have resources, but they are not sure what should be the value, what, what the value should be set to the buffer pool size and the read log file size. Because it's a read log file size and the buffer pool size plays very important role in the system throughput or TPS. So uh, what we did here is uh, the user sets this NURB dedicated server is equal to on. So MySQL automatically calculate the best size uh, for this buffer pool and the read log file size based on the physical memory available. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, it can run that. So here is the algorithm to uh, calculate this value. So one is the for the inner buffer pool size and the next is for inner DB log file size. So it takes physical memory into consideration and based on that set the values. Okay, the very important thing which we introduce in MySQL 8.0 is the parallel scan of table. So earlier uh, when the tables is being scanned, each and every row of the table is being scanned through a single thread and it was it, it might take some time. But now what we did in 8.0 is we divided this entire range of the deep nodes of the tree into multiple chunks. And we have one thread for each chunk which is reading the data. So this scan is happening in parallel. Uh, we have this configuration variable in ODB parallel thread count, which is uh, which can be set from 1 to 256. Default is 4. So these many threads will be used when the scanning is being done. And uh, uh, as of now, it is working only for the cluster index. And uh, we have already few scenarios where we are using this parallel scan. One of them is when we are doing a select count star to report the number of rows in the table. And then we have one second. We have this add index uh, mechanism in which the cluster index is being scanned. So there also we use a parallel index. Let me explain in the next slide how we use it in add index. So whenever we are doing an add in index, we uh, have to the parallel index entries and then have to put, put those records onto the files and make them based on the key use or the text value which is being added. And that put these uh, records into the into the tree. So everything was done in, in a serial order, but now cluster index is being done in parallel. That um, everything is writing into a tree file. This record and at the end, when we are doing more loading the tree, only that is being done in single thread. And now we are in progress to that part also in parallel. So making. Uh, these records and them into a single tree is also being done in parallel now. Uh, this is contention aware transcript which is in 8.0. So this was an idea being researched by the research in the University of Michigan. Idea is uh, so now in my SL, uh, database collection plumbing the resources allowed in first service is always asking for resources will get the resources. With the SCAT idea, uh, we give the result of the transaction on which the transactions are waiting. So let's say there is transaction one for which there are five transactions are waiting, and transaction T2, six transactions are waiting. And comes first, and T2 is behind T1, but T2 will get the result first to make the more and more transactions can finish and the system throughput can improve. So the analogy I give uh, is the cab and the bus driver. So let's say the cab driver and the bus driver are the destination, and the cab driver has four passengers, the bus driver has seventy passengers. And both of them ask for the coffee on the way. The cab driver asks for the coffee first, and the driver is standing behind it. So that will be before the cab driver will get the coffee. But cabs, the bus driver is taking fifty passengers, so first driver will get the first. And cab driver will get delayed. So that's driver can finish it and then go to the direction with 70 passengers. So this uh, no contribution required to be done by the user. Uh, internally, from people to automatically more and more control the system, we put ads to move the system to put And uh, here is the uh, uh, performance number which we have got from uh, CAT implemented. Right, so the way the current blob, uh, this, uh, the storage design is, if you want to access the last byte on the last blob page, you have to go to the cluster index record, get the reference, and go to the first page and scan through the entire blob and go to the last page. 
So when I say scan through the entire blob, that means you are bringing the, all the log pages or blob pages into the buffer pool and then going to the next page. So this was very IO consuming. So what we introduced in 8.0 is we introduced the log index uh, pages in between. So there's an indirection which we have introduced. So now with this log index pages are storing, they are storing the index entries uh, for the log pages. So we say, okay, from this offset to this offset for this particular log on which page this data is stored. So from the cluster index record, we take the reference to this uh, log index page. We go to that page, uh, read the entry, and then we see, okay, for this particular offset, the data is stored in XYZ blob page number. And then we, so we bring only that page num page into the buffer pool. So only the log index page and that page we are bringing to the buffer pool. So IO is very less. So this is the performance number which we have got uh, after this uh, change of storage mechanic, uh, storage architecture of blob data. So for 500 thread, we have uh, gone from 10,000 transmission per second to 110,000 transmission per second. I have also put the blog link here just in case if somebody wants to get more details about this feature. And then similarly, we have this compressed log uh, design also changed the way we stored it on the disk. So earlier, uh, when we are storing the compressed blob on the disk, we are taking the entire blob data and compress them together and store them on the disk. Uh, the problem is if you want to modify uh, the last byte on the last page or any byte on any page, you have to bring the entire stream into the disk and uncompress it and go to that particular page and then modify it, recompress it and store it. Really, are you consuming? What we did is uh, we did something similar. We introduced a Z-Lob index in between. So uh, what we did is we divided the entire lob data into multiple chunks and each is compressed separately. And then in the CLOB index pages, we have stored this information uh, from which offset to which offset of this blob data is stored in this particular blob stream. So whenever there's a request to read or modify the data on that particular offset, we go and bring only a small chunk of compressed data into buffer pool, uncompress it, and uh, modify it, recompress it, and store it. So this is the performance number which we have got uh, after this modification, the way we stored the compressed blob. And I have also put the uh, blog link here, where you can go and see uh, the details about this feature. And the second last feature which I wanted to talk about is the log free redo log. So whenever a, this is the right ahead log design, is whenever a transition is happening and before it can flush the data pages on the disk, the redo log has to be flushed. So this redo log is uh, is generated by the multiple mini transitions which are running. And each mini transition has to take a log on the log buffer. And then only it can write straight on the log buffer. The problem here is there are multiple transitions uh, running. With, each of them is creating multiple MTRs. And each of the MTR is waiting for this single mutex, the log sys mutex, to write onto the log buffer. It was a single bottleneck point. And what we did is we made it log free. So when I say it may be made it log free, the, the way it works now is that each MTR knows how much data it is uh, going to write on the log buffer. And when it comes to the writing the data on the log buffer, we allocate a specific region in the log buffer to that MTR. So every MTR has its own region assigned and they are writing into their own region. So there is no uh, MTR interfering with any other MTR. And once the data is written on the log buffer, it is being flushed or being written to the file system cache using log write thread. And then it is flushed to the disk using log flusher. And if at all there is any MTR or any transition which is waiting for it to be persisted on the disk, there is a log notifier thread which notifies this information that up to this LSN, the data has been persisted on the disk and yeah, the transition can commit. Uh, this is the benchmark or the performance uh, results which we have got. So for 256 connections, we have gone from 60,000 TPS to 240,000 TPS with this feature. And the last feature which I wanted to talk about is the clone. So uh, clone is a simple and very efficient way to create a MySQL replica. Uh, it's a physical snapshot of running MySQL server, and it can be used uh, by a replication setup or in, in the group replication cluster if you want to add a new node. It could be very useful. Uh, so the way it works is now we have uh, two servers. One is a donor server from where the data is to be cloned, and we have a recipient server where the data is to be cloned. 
and both of them should have the clone plugin installed and then there is a client which will connect to the recipient server and it will run this clone sql command and it will pass on the information about the host also or the donor also from the data has to be cloned then the clone plugin comes into picture at donor and it tries to or it, it takes all the data from the donor server and transfer it over the network to the recipient server this data includes everything the ivd files the redo logs everything and then it goes to the recipient server and then the recipient server flushes everything on the disk and restarts and the regular recovery mechanism happens. and once the, once the recipient server is restarted it has the exact data which was there on the donor server it's an exact replica of donor server now so the con uh, in the clone we are uh, not cloning the configuration parameters because the port like the port might be different from recipient and the uh, donor server but there are some configurations which must match like the page size of inodb page size should match both on the recipient and the donor server also they should always be on the same mysql version the cross version cloning is not supported and we do not clone binary logs and as of now the clone is supported only for inodb tables if you have tables in any, any other storage engine that is cloned as a temporary or, or as an empty tables and uh, concurrent deals on the donor uh, was not supported when the model introduced but uh, in the last year i guess we uh, did this feature which supports concurrent details on donor server when the clone is going on and yeah uh, that's all i had and this is the link for the uh, uh, blogs where all the mysql developers writes about uh, the features which we are developing and you can get more details about the new features coming